changing the game for people living with MND, a scoping review exploring inclusive gaming. Hello everyone, thanks for joining our session. Today we're going to begin by talking about why this project and share some of our stories. Then we're going to talk about the aims of our scope and review, and then we're going to share some of the key results and findings that we've gathered through this process. Ten years ago, I was a busy, active academic and mum. I swam and went to the gym between lectures. What my six-year-old daughter came me to school and enjoyed cooking and catching up with friends for coffee. When I had time, I chilled out by playing a variety of puzzle games on my iPad or computer, and my mom, sisters, and I enjoyed connecting by playing online Scrabble. During the year, my legs started cramping, then tripping and falling which I managed to ignore until I fell three times during a short walk to a conference dinner. I saw my GP and she referred me to a neurologist for tests. The 7th of January 2013 is the day our lives were upended as my husband Denzel and I held hands in the neurologist's office and she gave us the devastating news that I have motor neuron disease. The neurologist explained that death of the motor neurons causes our muscles to weaken and shrink, and we progressively lose the ability to move, speak, swallow and breathe. The pace and order of change vary widely, but typically people die within two to three years. The clinic nurse eloquently described the edge of a disease. It is pretty strong active body, so that now I can only move my face, can barely swallow and can't speak or breathe. Tubes connect a ventilator and feeding machine to my curious cyborg body and a team of carers provides round-the-clock care to keep me alive. I have always enjoyed playing games. But gaming has become more valuable to me as MND has taken many of the activities I previously enjoyed as well as control over much of my life. Both how and what I play has changed with my changing body. As my arms grew weaker I needed armrests cradling my arms to use a computer keyboard and found it easier to manipulate an iPad on my lap. With increasing difficulty moving my hands I transitioned to a smaller tablet, and then phone, and abandoned games which required speed. Finally I became unable to even tap or swipe the screen. For a while I settled on giving suggestions as my husband and young daughter created fabulous worlds in Minecraft. Where I shared the fun problem solving and appreciated the gorgeous design in a hands-free way, as our family bonded during collective games of Monument Valley. I now use a neural node to operate my iPhone. Its electrodes are attached to the skin over a muscle, and pick up the electrical signal my brain sends when I try to move. The signals are sent to my iPhone by Bluetooth, and use the phone's inbuilt switch control function, so I can choose and use apps, including games, as well as typing text to speak. It's remarkable life transforming technology. Initially I activated the neural node with tiny thumb twitches. Now, being able to play games by wiggling my eyebrows is my superpower. I know anecdotally that others in the MND community appreciate the fun that video games can provide. It has been great working with Ben, Matt and Tash to map out what other research tells WS about how to make video games more inclusive for the MND community. Hi everyone, I'm Ben O'Mara. I'm the Information Resources Manager at Motor Neuron Disease Australia and an adjunct fellow in the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales. I hope that by working on this scoping review, we can find ways to make daily life not just easier for people living with MND, but also more enjoyable. 
and through fun and creative approaches to games development. Hi, my name's Dr Natasha Dwyer. I work for Victoria University Australia and I'm super excited to be involved in this project because we're exploring how technology, everyday technology that people might already have to be able to assist in new ways. Hello, my name's Dr Matthew Harrison and I'm a senior lecturer and researcher in learning intervention at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. I'm really excited about this project because I get to combine my love of inclusive gaming with research working with people with lived experiences of MND. What is the scoping review? A mapping of past studies, evaluations, and other forms of evidence from research and practice that have looked at what helps make video games more fun and easier to play for people living with MND. So what did we review? Well, we looked at studies from across the world, um, but we only looked at studies that were conducted in English and published between 2011 and July 2021. We've also started the process of looking at grey literature, which is drawn from Australia, New Zealand, UK, the US and Canada. So grey literature includes things like any kinds of reports, evaluations, communication materials or other documents that might appear on the websites of peak bodies, nonprofits, or government agencies. So we found 39 relevant studies in the health literature and the studies were mostly conducted in the US in multiple countries and mostly Western Europe, US, UK and or East Asia, Canada and Germany. The studies included people living with MND, ALS and others dealing with conditions like cerebral palsy, paralysis and stroke, as well as their carers, family and loved ones and clinicians, allied health professionals, robotics engineers and assistive equipment equipment and technology specialists, game developers and programs. Most of the studies were conducted in universities, hospitals and clinics, with a couple taking place in people's homes. A small number of studies focused on just people living with MND and many focused on people living with MND, ALS and or others with similar forms of motor impairment and movement issues. And similarly, a small number of studies focused just on digital games and most studies focus on technology that could be used to play games. Most studies focus on inter interface technology, so brain-computer interfaces uh, and or eye-tracking devices, or, or were more general forms of research into assistive and communication technology, ethics in technology, and or policy and programs for technology. Our narrative charting of these studies is still underway, but would like to report on general outcomes of the studies included so far. Over half the studies reported that BCIs, touchscreens and or eye gaze devices enabled interaction with computers and other technology, including to play games, but their use was also limited. And about one quarter of the studies found that people living with MND slash ALS and those with similar motor impairment issues have expressed preferences and concerns for how BCIs and other forms of technology, including technology used for games, are researched and developed. And a smaller group of studies found that specific programs or projects have supported free or affordable access to assistive technology, computers and other devices that can be used with games. So we've identified very clear areas of focus for making games easier to play with people living with MND, but these areas are also these areas also suggest major gaps and limitations too. What do these studies tell us? Common characteristics of the studies included were user-driven approaches technology like BCI, eye tracking, head mounted display, auditory, keyboard, tablet. Games that were considered enjoyable, fun and easy to play by the research team writing the paper, but as my colleague Kirsten points out, perhaps not from the perspective of the person playing the game. And support for communication and motor disability, fatigue, carer support, decision making, change and disease progression. So what type of games? Term-based and time-sensitive, and often the games used in the studies were what we call dead boring. So old-fashioned games like tic-tac-toe when there's a lot more innovative options available to people now. Most studies also demonstrate a sensitivity to the needs of people living with MMD 
and or those with motor impairment. The evidence suggested there was major gaps in comprehensive qualitative research involving people living with MND and their experiences of video games. So while the researchers were mindful of the needs, there wasn't much emphasis on the voices of those who the researchers were trying to help. And the links between the policy and the program, such as government-funded support for access to technology, was also another major gap that we identified through this process. The evidence suggests that playing games can reduce boredom, improve quality of life, and connect with family and friends. And that's really what this project's about, is about gaming for joy and social connection, rather than therapy. So what does this mean for the future of research, development, and practice? Well, we want to have a focus on fun. We want to use a centered perspective that prioritizes fun rather than therapy. Of course, therapy is important, but so too is fun and connection with family and loved ones. We want to have uh, identify future research areas to explore, including how we can adapt domestic technology and games for use by people living with MMD. We want to gain further insights from the social sciences and the grey literature, and this is a process that we're continuing to develop right now. And finally, we want an interdisciplinary approach, and that represents our team who come from a number of fields, and that include game studies, health technology, and the social sciences. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please make sure you reach out.